So what this says, right, is that your genetics doesn't completely determine who you are. The environment around you shapes the packaging material of your DNA and directs, to some extent, how your DNA is going to work. So that already tells us that we are indeed more than our genes. So maybe the question we really need to ask is, are we more than our biology, right? Are we more than the material things, genes or otherwise, that make up our bodies? As a biologist, I've learned at least three major lessons that I'd like to share with you today that I think help provide a framework for exploring that important question. First, biological science is very rarely about proof. Rather, it's, it's more about accumulating evidence toward a reasonable or likely or compelling explanation. You know, in theoretical mathematics, one deals with derivations and, and hard rules and proofs. In contrast, in the biological sciences, one is usually collecting diverse kinds of data and making inferences. Now, now don't get me wrong, there's certainly a logic that guides your inferences, but it's often more imprecise than people realize. Science is, you know, it's actually a lot like detective work. Um, and in fact, that's what I find so fun about the research uh, that me and my lab do. I mean, think of what a detective does. Right? He or she is faced with a crime and essentially has to reconstruct the course of events that led to the crime. Obviously, often there are many possibilities. And so the job of the detective is to gather information and make a case for the most likely possibility. Oftentimes, the case is so strong that it feels like a proof to me and you. But it's not really. It's just a far more compelling scenario than any other possible explanation. It's sometimes the same way in biology. As a scientist, I'm faced with a particular unexplained biological phenomenon and essentially have to uncover the hidden mechanisms uh, by which it occurs. So this is a lot more like messy detective work uh, than it is like proving theorems in theoretical mathematics. And so that brings me to the second lesson that I've learned, and that is that biological science is constantly self-correcting. And it almost never closes the door on a possibility, even if it happens to defy present assumptions. A prominent example in my field is the concept of junk DNA. And many of you may have even heard about this. Prior to the genome era, the prevailing wisdom among many scientists was that substantive portions of the genome were likely non-functional. That's why they were sort of given the name junk or nonsense. Later on, many of the same scientists eventually produced the evidence that demonstrated that this was wrong. My point here is no matter how tightly held the view of junk DNA was at one point, there was still an openness in the scientific community to the possibility that it wasn't junk. And it was ultimately this openness that led to new evidence, the dismantling of the misconceptions, and scientific advancement. It's for this reason that you will very rarely see universal negatives issued in biology. I mean, even the vocal atheist uh, Richard Dawkins accepted that as a scientist, he must concede that there could be something incredibly grand and incomprehensible and beyond our present understanding. Now, I don't want to misrepresent Richard's position here. He certainly doesn't believe in a higher power. But my point here is that as a scientist, he is compelled to concede the possibility however unlikely he may ultimately believe that to be. Finally, the third lesson is that some questions that have arisen from work in genetics cannot be addressed by tools in, in genetics or biology. For example, you know, at some point during the study of genetics, the question uh, often arises, why did life forms originate in the first place? And it's a natural question to ask, and we're free to speculate, but science is not really equipped to answer that question. And using science to answer questions like these is, sometimes feels like using colors to describe numbers. I mean, I think you'll agree that color, though by itself is meaningful, is not at all a meaningful construct to understand numbers. So while work in science might naturally lead us to ask such questions, it's evident that science does not always have a clear answer or even the toolkit to approach the answer. I want to make a critical point here. This doesn't mean that there is an answer somewhere else. It just means that we have to be faithful to what science is. And we can't extend the purview of science beyond what it is capable of addressing. So how do these lessons inform the pursuit 
of the answer to the question, are we more than our biology? I believe that they liberate us from shackles um, and the commonly held and often propagated view that science categorically disproves the supernatural, or even that science is the sole arbiter of truth. In fact, science is necessarily agnostic with respect to anything outside of the natural realm. It neither accepts it nor can it refute it. So the important point here is that science does not constrain us to look only to science in our search for identity. Again, doesn't imply that there's anything anywhere else, but it doesn't constrain us to look only to science in our pursuit. So what else might define who I am? Well, maybe my name is a good starting point. So my name, uh, Praveen Setupati, is of Sanskrit origin. And Praveen means skillful. Setupati means lord of the bridge. And the bridge refers to a former chain of limestone shoals that uh, connected the southern tip of India to the northern coast of Sri Lanka. And according to um, the ancient Hindu epic, the Ramayana, the bridge was constructed by Lord Rama and his army. So uh, needless to say, my, my name is steeped in, in ancient Indian tradition and Hindu lore. And my Indian heritage is a part of who I am. Um, I'm proud of it. I was raised as a Hindu for 18 years. And I appreciated Hinduism as a rich culture to enjoy. But it wasn't until my college years that I realized I didn't really know much about Hinduism as a belief system to live by. I had kind of gone through the motions of various aspects of Hinduism and was familiar with many of the traditions and stories of the faith. But I realized that I had no idea what it, or frankly, religion in general, meant to me or how it shaped me, if at all. I hadn't really stopped to think about it. Right? In college, a friend introduced me to the Christian Bible. And as I sat there reading it, I became intrigued by how it compared with other religions. And so over the course of several years, um, I attempted to read the scriptures from many different faith traditions, including Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam. What was it that stood out for me in Christianity? It was meeting the character of Jesus. He's the supposed hero of this story, right? And there he is, naked, disfigured, and, and almost too pathetic for me to even read on in the story. It was not the you know, superhero Krishna that I so enjoyed and uh, was used to reading about, or even the sort of valiant you know, warrior Muhammad that I eventually spent some time studying. One of the first things I would learn is that in the cross, that thing that seemed so pathetic to me, Jesus was turning upside down our notions of power. He wasn't on the cross, it seems, because he was powerless to stop it. He was on the cross because that's how far he'd go to exercise his power to make things new. I mean, you and I often exercise power uh, by forcing our authority or perceived superiority on others um, in the world. Jesus seemed to be exercising his power by laying his life down before the world. It seemed backwards. In other words, he was choosing to use his power solely for the benefit of others and not himself. I, frankly, had never really read anything like this, particularly in a religious context, which to me was more about, at the time, morality and law. Now, None of this made me a Christian, but it did really intrigue me. And it made me want to deepen my knowledge of this person, who seemed in many ways uh, so contrary to uh, what I would have imagined a hero of a story to be. So at some point, I became involved in evaluating the various claims of the gospel accounts. And really, the first question was, what is the evidence that Jesus even existed? You know, in scientific research, we are trained to go to great lengths to design experiments in a way that reduces bias as much as possible. You'll all be very familiar with this. That is, we aim to avoid or account for any tendencies in the experimental setup that might encourage you know, one result over another. I think I must have had this impulse even in my early years because it was critical to me at that time to examine the evidence for the historicity of Christ outside of the Bible, which of course I viewed as a biased source. 
I was surprised at the time to find that several non-Christian ancient historians had recorded events about Jesus. One example is the writings of Josephus, a first century Jewish scholar and historian. He's considered by many to be a premier source of first century Jewish history. His works include multiple references not only to Jesus, uh, but also to several of the other characters that are central to the biblical account of Jesus' life. So this includes, you know, John the Baptist or Herod the Great or Pontius Pilate. Now, to be clear, even this is not bias-free. For example, there is some evidence to suggest that the texts of Josephus may have been contaminated over time with what's called Christian interpolation, meaning there could have been some tampering right, with the text, possibly even the injection of references to Jesus that were not originally there. What one learns upon digging further is that the writings of Josephus, as well as a number of other ancient historians, have been subject over the years to very meticulous language analysis. And the broad consensus among numerous Christian and non-Christian scholars is that when you strip away anything that may be perceived to be inauthentic, what you're left with still includes direct references to Jesus and his contemporaries. The first century Roman historian Tacitus also specifically mentions Jesus, as well as his crucifixion and the Roman persecution of the early Christians. What's interesting about that text is that Tacitus writes in a way that is clearly derogatory toward Christians and the Christian faith. And so it takes quite a bit of mental gymnastics to imagine that this text could be the product solely of Christian tampering. And you know, it isn't just Josephus and Tacitus. There are other examples, of course. But let's be fair. Analyses of ancient texts, uh, it's fraught with all sorts of challenges. And none of this you know, extra biblical documentation was necessarily slam dunk evidence to me. But the point is that it was certainly much more than I would have expected to find if Jesus was merely a legend or a fabrication of creative minds. Now, I mean, it's one thing to examine whether Jesus was a real historical figure. Many non-Christians even accept this. But it's quite another to examine whether he really was resurrected. And this matters a whole lot because the resurrection is central to the Christian faith. In fact, Christianity actually rises or falls on the validity of the resurrection. None of it matters if the resurrection did not happen. So to examine the claims of the, the, the resurrection, I focused at the time largely on the biblical narrative itself. And in retrospect, this is not unlike what I do as a scientist sometimes when I evaluate the validity of the claims in a novel scientific paper. That is, I look for clues in the description of the experiments and the data that help me evaluate the reliability of the overall conclusions and interpretation. I mean, in doing this with the biblical account of the resurrection, I was struck by several features of the story. And I'd like to share just a couple of them with you to give you a sense of what I mean. First, consider Jesus' disciples. As the story unfolds, the disciples are rather confused by everything that's happening, and frankly, they come across as not only a bit dense, but immature. They just don't seem to grasp the profundity of what's happening, and they're still sort of scared by it all. Contrast this, okay, with the women in the story, who are bold, faithful, and much more in tune with who Jesus is. In fact, it's the women that first find the empty tomb, it's a woman that the resurrected Jesus first appears to, and it's the women who have the privilege of sharing with the community the good news that Jesus has been raised from the dead. I mean, this might seem like a small detail, but I want to assure you, this is a really big deal for that time period. I mean, at the time, to put it very mildly, women were not well respected. And their word was so undervalued that, for example, their witness was not even admissible in court. And I had to ask myself the question, if you're making up a story that you want others to follow, why in the world would you cast yourself and your buddies in such a poor light and have yourself be outwitted and outblessed at every turn by women, who, as I said at the time, were thought of in a rather pejorative manner? Just didn't compute. Second, consider the well-documented exponential growth of the early Christian movement despite tremendous persecution even unto death. The biblical account makes it clear that the entire faith rests on the validity of the empty tomb of Christ. Now, 
let's suppose the tomb was not really empty. If you want to devise a clever story to maximize followers, okay, why lay as the foundation of your movement something that is so easy to disprove? I mean, walk over to the tomb and check it out. Right? In fact, it seems that historically, even most detractors of Christianity um, have accepted the empty tomb. And this is why many alternate theories actually have been proposed as to how the tomb became empty. In the interest of you know, getting back to the main point of today's talk, I won't get into all of these now. But suffice to say, the task for me at the time was to determine the model or the explanation that best fit these kinds of data and features in the story. And this is by nature a very inexact process. But it is often what we do in science as well. I mean, consider the theory of common descent, which proposes an evolutionary model for biological life that all living organisms share a common ancestor. I mean, I, together with the vast majority of biologists, are strong proponents of common descent. And the reason for this is not because we can provide proof in the purest sense of the word, as I suppose that would entail going back in history and, and reliving it. Rather, it's because of the accumulation of diverse types of supporting evidence that strongly challenge the plausibility of really any other explanatory model. In fact, it's the genomic data generated in the last decade, which I'm involved in studying, that in my opinion most powerfully bolsters the evolutionary model. And I share this because this is to some extent how I approached the claims of historicity of both Christ as well as the resurrection. So why was all this examination so important? And, and moreover, why am I taking all this time telling you about it? The first reason is that stripped of Christ, Christianity was no more or less compelling to me than any other faith tradition. I mean, it was the person of Jesus that made all the difference to me. And so it was vital to me that I examine some of these claims. The second reason, and I think this one is more germane to today's topic, is that if Jesus is who he said he was, then I have to ask, what did he have to say about our collective search for identity? Well, he says that we find our true identity in him. And this is perhaps best encapsulated in Paul's statement in Galatians that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. What, of course, that doesn't mean that he has taken over our body physically. And so what this is conveying is that we have a spiritual nature, which Christ wants to mold and transform, that is not entirely captured by the material substance of our body. This is a belief. It is not testable or set forth by science. And as such, I entirely understand that it can be unnerving. I've been there. But it is something that is established in my life, ultimately as part of a relationship. I mean, I want to emphasize here that my various examinations of the historicity of Christ and other claims of the Bible did not bring me to full faith, as much as they broke down barriers that might have prevented me from considering the possibility of a deeper spiritual reality. You know, in some ways, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's kind of like the love I have for my wife. Ultimately, it's not scientifically provable, per se, but it's certainly real. And she trusts it as real because of the experience and the depth of our relationship over the last 15 years. It's been very much the same for me as I have pursued getting to know the person of Christ. 